Today in this video we're going to talk about the estate of Tomzik, an interesting case that came out of the Court of Appeals a couple months ago. My name is Gregory Singleton. I'm an estate planning and probate attorney with Signature Law. Signature Law is located in Minneapolis, Minnesota and serves the Twin Cities and Greater Minnesota alike. Just a reminder, if you like today's video, please feel free to hit that like and subscribe button. It actually really does help support the channel. Also, a couple caveats before we get going. First of all, this video is for educational purposes only. And second of all, and specifically in this video, we're gonna be talking about Minnesota law. The law may be dramatically different in other states, so be sure to talk to an estate planning professional in that state before you sit down and plan your estate or consider contesting a probate. Uh, talking about probate, just as a preliminary, probate is interesting. Usually there's a fair amount of money at issue, and there's oftentimes a lot of emotion tied to that money. So we have a lot of interesting cases. When they come out, we don't have a lot of cases about probate or case law, but when they come out, they can be pretty interesting. So um, the issue in this case was how to apply an apparently ambiguous statute to a provision of a will. Specifically, after a divorce, does a provision of a will that devises, that gives a gift to my wife, or if my wife does not survive me, to my wife's heirs, where does that go? So a few facts about the case. First of all, uh, Mr. Tomzik and his wife were married in 1992. Uh, the, he drafted his will in 1995. He, uh, they dissolved their marriage in 2019, and in 2021, uh, he died. Uh, his wife still survived him. Now, a few facts, uh, neither he nor his wife meet remarried. Uh, they didn't have children either separately or together, um, and they, uh, he never rescinded his will. Now, the text of the will specifically said that the, I give my entire estate to my wife. That's what Mr. Tomzik said, all, it all goes to my wife. But if, if my wife does not survive me, then uh, everything goes to my wife's heir. Actually, half of it goes to my heirs, half of my estate goes to my wife's heirs. And in this case, if his wife did survive him, but if his wife didn't survive him, they didn't have children, um, if you don't have ki a spouse, it goes down to your kids, and if you don't have kids, it goes up to your parents. And in this case, the parents of the wife were surviving. So here are the statutes that are at issue. The first one is Minnesota Statute 524.2-804, uh, Subdivision 1, and it says that unless you say otherwise in a will, if you give a gift to your spouse um, and then you divorce, uh, then your spouse gets nothing, unless you say otherwise in your will. And that goes the same as a personal representative. You appoint your spouse as a personal representative and then you divorce, they skip over your spouse and they go to the next person in line. Uh, subdivision two of that statute describes how we get there. We don't just say we skip over your former spouse. We presume your former spouse is deceased or predeceases you, and then we go to the next person in line. So that makes an interesting dilemma. We have a gift going to the spouse. We presume that the spouse is dead. If the uh, spouse is dead, the statute says that we give to the next person in line. And as the will was drafted, the next person in line is the spouse's uh, heirs. In this case, the spouse's parents. That's interesting. So how did the district court take this? Well, they looked at it and they said, let's look at the intent of the testator, which is always what you're trying to do in probate. You're trying to find out what the person who wrote the will um, what they intended when they wrote that will. And they said, well, um, giving to my wife's heirs is contingent on the decedent having been married at the time of his death. So when he died, he didn't have a wife. So therefore, he, his wife's heirs are not in the picture. He doesn't, they don't exist because he has no heirs to his wife. Um, they said that his intent was that if he was unmarried, he wouldn't want his estate to go to his former spouse's heirs. That's what, when I spoke with about this case to a number of professionals in the estate planning and probate profession, that's kind of what they said that they would expect. The Court of Appeals looked at this and found something different. They said, we read the statute straight. Under the law, the wife is presumed dead. Therefore, in accordance with the will, 
the gift skips over the wife and goes to the next person in line who under the will is the wife's heirs. And they came at this with a three pronged analysis. Actually, they had a bit more analysis in there, but three points that I thought were kind of interesting. First of all, they looked at the idea of giving to a, a class, making a class gift. A class gift is if you give, say, to your children. Um, you don't, your children, you could have more children. You could write the will, have two kids, and then have three more before you die. Your children, if determined at the time of your death, would be five, as opposed to the two if it was determined at the time of writing the will, and you can actually write that into the will. But they said that at the time of execution, the decedent and the testator was married. So we focus on that, that he was married at the time of uh, execution. However, you cannot determine your heirs until you die. You can presume where your heirs are probably going to be or could be, but heirs, remember, are the people who survive you. So you don't know who's going to survive you until you die. So we, uh, at the time of drafting the will, we know you're married, and then at the time of your death, we know who your heirs are, we put those together, it goes to your wife's heirs. I don't think it's the greatest argument, but they, they seem to rely on that quite a bit. The next two arguments they made were actually a little bit more interesting. First of all, they did a classic statutory interpretation analysis, and they said, we cannot rewrite the law just to find the spirit of the law. The respondent in this case said, look, what the law really wanted to do was cut out the wife and their side of the family. That was the intent of the legislature. Well, the Court of Appeal said that may have been what they wanted to do, but that's not what they wrote down, and we can only rely on what they wrote down in the law. We cannot rewrite the law just to try to meet what the legislature meant. That would be judicial activism, and that would be bad. So in this case, because how they wrote it uh, gives all the gift to the wife's heirs, that's how we have to interpret it. The third argument that they made was actually probably the most compelling, in, in my opinion. Uh, they looked at the legislative history, and there are some problems looking at legislative history when interpreting the law, but in this case, it's kind of interesting. They said that the Minnesota law for probate, for the Minnesota Probate Code is based on what's called the uh, Uniform Probate Code. A uniform code, and they have uniform codes for all areas of law, not all areas of law, but many areas of law. And what it is, is this group of academics and professionals and uh, former judges, and, and everyone gets together, a committee gets together and says, if we had to write the ideal probate code in this case, this is what it would be. And then they propose that, and they say, dear 50 states, we recommend, these are our recommendations for the probate code, adopt what you wish. Some states will adopt it entirely. Some states will adopt it in part. For the Uniform Probate Code, the provision that revoked gifts or devises to former spouses was written in 1975. Minnesota adopted this. They said, that's a good law. We don't want to give to former spouses. We're going to adopt this portion of the UPC. In 1990, the UPC was amended to add in the expanded former spouse revocation to include any device to a, a relative of a divorced individual, uh, their, for, their former spouse. So they did, the UPC was expanded in 1990 to include what the district court presumed was what was the intent of the legislation. Now, Minnesota did not adopt the 1990 version with the expanded revocation. The court said, well, you adopted the first half in 1975, but you did not adopt the 1990 court, uh, amendment. You could have, you knew about it, therefore you chose not to. Therefore, the intent of the legislature must have been to not include that further revocation. That's actually a pretty good argument. Now, the minority in the Court of Appeals, the dissent, obviously disagreed. They said that uh, if we look at a class gift, giving to the heirs of, a, of, your, of your wife, well, that is reliant on their being a wife at the time we determine the heirs. So they took the first argument of the, of the majority in the Court of Appeals and flipped it on its head and said, look, it's reliant on there being a wife. There was no wife because they're divorced. Therefore, the, um, the heirs of the former spouse get nothing. Second, 
They distinguished some uh, prior case law. I'm not going to go into that now, but they actually did a very nice job in looking at the care case. And third, they said, let's just look at this obviously. This is another canon of statutory interpretation. We try to avoid ridiculous uh, results. And in this case, consider the situation. We got a husband and wife. They get divorced. And in this case, it was the wife, or the, the husband was the testator. The wife, what if she remarried? Under the facts of the case, had she remarried, the next person in line, uh, the wife's heirs, would be her new spouse. So that the testator, his entire, or half of his entire estate, would not go to his wife, but would go to his wife's new spouse, therefore pretty much going to the, the, the former wife. And that's a ridiculous situation. We want to avoid it. So... In the end, of course, the majority uh, controls and the dissent does not control. However, this case is only at the Minnesota Court of Appeals. We have the Minnesota Supreme Court. I don't know if this case is going to be uh, appealed uh, all the way up to the Supreme Court. I have a hunch that it might be. Depends on how much money is at issue and how much everyone des uh, desires to, to pursue it. Um, but that is the estate of Tom Zick. I hope you enjoyed today's video. Uh, who got it right? That's the big question. If you think that the majority got it right, let me know in the comments. If you think that the dissent got it right, again, let me know in the comments. Also, if you have questions, uh, leave them in the comments below or send me an email. Uh, we do a new video every other Wednesday. Um, I hope you liked today's video. If you did, do like and subscribe. Really appreciate it. It does help support the channel. Otherwise, until next time, this is Gregory Singleton with Signature Law.